Hello everyone, and welcome to the beginning of a special three-part presentation of The Man About Town. I'm John W., your host for this evening. This three-part installment will be about a very special California resident, one that was here long before any of us, and who almost disappeared just a few short years ago. That most ancient of native Californians, the California Condor. California and most of the rest of the world was a very different place 30,000 or so years ago. Our mountains were in permanent snow, glaciers filled the high valleys, and even our warmest areas could count on heavy winter snows. There were mammoths, saber cats, giant ground sloths, and other strange and wonderful animals that are no longer here. But there was one that saw them all, and likely fed on the remains of the very last ones, and it's still here today. It is Jimna Gyps californianus, the California condor. The largest bird still living in North America, it's about five feet from beak to tail and has a wingspan of just over nine feet. It's very heavy, with males often exceeding 20 pounds. It's a member of the New World vultures, which are related to the storks, very distinct from the Old World vultures, which are classified with the other birds of prey, or raptors. Like the other vulture species, it is a carrion feeder, depending primarily upon expired carcasses found visually during flight. Despite some claims to the contrary, it is not a predator, the only credible instance being an old report of an immature bird that was said to have caught and eaten a small frog. During the last Pleistocene Ice Age, they ranged across the continent, feasting upon the carcasses of mammoths and other huge animals of the day. Though small in number, as is typical with the larger scavengers, they thrived on the megafaunal bounty. But as the Pleistocene Ice Age neared its end, the glaciers retreated, the snowfalls contracted, and the flatlands began transforming into deserts. And the now over-insulated megafauna of the day began to disappear, and along with them went the condor's maiden food source. But there were other megafauna about, the great sea mammals and as the coasts warmed, they and their washed up carcasses could be found in ever increasing numbers. And so the condors, like so many did before, left the rest of the continent and made for the coast, but now in diminished numbers. And sometime before that, another two-footed group appeared on the scene, the Native American peoples. They had little impact on the condor, though the condor had a big impact on some of them weaving its way into their art, culture, and legends. Many would name it the Thunderbird and attribute to it the powers of the heavens. It could have gone on like this for ages, but a new player would soon hit the scene. In 1602, Father Antonio de la Ascension reported several of them feeding on a whale carcass. Other Europeans would follow in his wake and report sightings as well. Soon they moved in to stay, but unlike the natives' relations, the Europeans would be little affected by the condors, while the condors would be heavily affected by them. The last remaining land megafauna, the bison, would be slaughtered, and the whales and seals would be hunted for meat, oil, and fur, and the local wildlife would be replaced with cattle ranches. So the condors adapted again as best they could and took advantage of the ranch's inefficiencies, feeding on the dead adults and the frequently stillborn calves. Nowhere near as good a situation as before, their numbers diminished again. Of course, no self-respecting rancher wants to be seen as careless or inefficient, as would be evidenced by high immortality in the adults and inordinate stillbirths in the young, so scapegoats were in order, and one of these scapegoats would be the California condor. Hunting began on them, and on other scapegoats like wolves or eagles, and on basically anything else they could put a bullet through. The condor population continued to fall. Then another century would turn, and the ranches began to disappear. Hunters, mainly of deer, now roamed the land, shooting some for food, but many for sport, leaving many hundreds of carcasses and gut piles behind. The condors adapted, but diminished again, and soon almost all that remained were restricted to California alone. But not everyone saw this without concern, and some tried to do something about it. 
Local anti-shooting laws were enacted, but with little effect. Some zoos obtained condor pairs and put them together in cages, hoping that they would breed. Some tried, but none even made it as far as a fertile egg. And in 1937, the U.S. Forest Service established the 1,200-acre Sisquat Condor Sanctuary. It was becoming apparent that far too little was known about the California condor. So in 1939, the National Audubon Society assigned Carl B. Kofer to do an extensive field study of the birds. Several years in the field yielded his book, The California Condor, in 1953. It was a major accomplishment, especially in regards to being the first, but it also harbored some of the problems of being the first. It contained a lot of opinion mixed in with the facts and with no soon to follow second to provide scientific comparison, it was difficult or nearly impossible to reliably sort fact from opinion or even fiction. And this would come back to haunt others. In 1952, Kenton C. Lint of the San Diego Zoo submitted the first soundly planned proposal for a captive breeding program. He and the zoo were granted conditional permits and construction of breeding facilities began. But because of assertions by Kofer that captive breeding was wrong and doomed to failure, the Audubon Society protested, the permits were revoked, and language was written into state law that would prevent any f new permits. Years passed, legal protection was officially granted by the state, and the Sespe Condor Sanctuary established. Censuses were organized with different teams and procedures delivering different numbers over the years, but all showing continuing decline. Then in 1967, a starved juvenile male condor was rescued and placed in the Los Angeles Zoo and named Topa Topa. He would break the legal stranglehold on captive birds and mark the beginning of there being at least one captive condor at any given time. The decade turned and both the federal government and California implemented their respective Endangered Species Acts. But the decline in numbers continued and actually accelerated. By the mid-70s, it was becoming obvious that without some greater form of assistance, the California condor would likely be gone before the next millennium. And so in 1975, the Audubon Society and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service formed the California Condor Recovery Team. Headed by John Ogden and Noel Snyder, they would now begin the long and difficult task of picking up where Coford left off. And it would spell the beginning of a new chapter in the life of the California condor. That's the first part of this three-part presentation on the California condor. Tune in again for the second part of this special feature from the man about town.